welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book, movie, compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and this is Ellen. Where'd you go, Ellen? Ellen? Katie? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. I can see you, but I can't hear you. I can Oh! There you are. Hey! Hey! And let's just keep rolling. (laughs) Right into our rolling rehash. Last week, we discussed Chapter 13, The Very Secret Diary, and its corresponding film scenes. Hermione coughed up fur balls, while Moaning Myrtle flooded the halls. Lockhart created Valentine's Day hell. Harry used the diary for intel. He traveled to the past for answers at long last. Riddle set the scene, making Hagrid look guilty, and definitely not 13. During episode 31, this time we rhyme. Our Potter pondering was to request you write us your own Potter poetry. We got some great rhymes back. My personal favorite is the one Max wrote just for me. Aw, it's a rhyming haiku. Harry hearing snakes. Ron belching up slimed up slugs. Winged dwarves cause headaches. It's a haiku. It rhymes. And it's applicable to the Chamber of Secrets. Well done, Max. Mm-hmm. He also wrote us a regular poem. Tonight while drinking sweet red wine, from a glass whose quality was truly fine, I took my book with not much vigor, and wept as Peter took sweet digger. E. <laughs> That's some excellent poetic license right there. Quincy had a good one, too. I think Harry is the best, even though his hair's a mess. He looks like his dad, which I think is quite rad. But his eyes weren't his mom's, so I'm stressed. And then he adds in parentheses that he is specifically referring to the movie, obviously. If that's the case, I'm not sure I would describe his hair as a mess. But maybe in the fourth movie. Ugh, everyone's hair was a mess in the fourth movie. But it was a hot mess, and that's a totally different kind of mess. That's very true. Mm Mm-hmm. Dave had a really fun limerick, too. There once was a wizard named Harry. The dark wizard he fought was quite scary. Death Eaters galore, Gilderoy Lockhart's or bore, is Voldy all moldy, yes very. <laughs> Though we are really trying to make appendix a thing, I'll give him a pass since that's not an easy word to rhyme. It took me a while, but I eventually came up with, Lockhart doesn't know when to hush. Of himself, he always will gush. He is an appendix up to his usual shticks until Ron's wand turns his memory to mush. <laughs> Tabitha also shared, I'll see about adding to the stream of verse. Maybe in a week? Hard to play along if you're on a Quidditch winning streak. I would say that Max might agree with that if you change Quidditch winning streak to trivia winning streak. But it isn't quite accurate. But that's only because he was the first to answer a trivia question this week, putting him now at a two-week streak. And he also wrote us two Harry Potter rhymes. So he clearly didn't find it hard to play along with either, and was the first person to tell us where they found Petrified Hermione. Which was near the library. Congratulations on your newly started streak, Max. Though we do want to give Robert a shout out for being right on Max's heels with the correct answer. So close. Maybe next time. Dave was also right there, but claims to have gotten sidetracked falling down the rabbit hole of fan theories about where Hermione was found. Apparently, there's a lot of speculation on whether or not it's true that she was found near the library. Yeah, I'm not really sure why, though, as both the book and the movie say they found her near the library. It seems pretty obvious to me that she was there looking up the basilisk and ended up being petrified on her way out. I still have more trouble believing the fact that she tore a page out of a book. Yeah, I mean, I guess she was just in a big hurry, but it is definitely very un to tear a page out of a book and write in it. Scandalous. But let's just keep rolling into chapter 14, Cornelius Fudge and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 14, Cornelius Fudge. Harry, Ron, and Hermione always knew that Hagrid loves large and monstrous creatures. 
During their first year, he tried to raise a dragon and had a three-headed dog named Fluffy. If, as a boy, Hagrid heard there was a monster somewhere in the castle, Harry is sure Hagrid would do anything to see it, and probably felt bad that it had been cooped up for so long. He is also sure that Hagrid would never have meant to kill anyone. He wishes he had never figured out how to work Riddle's diary, because he's getting sick of recounting what he had seen to Ron and Hermione, and the long circular conversations that follow. Hermione thinks Riddle might have gotten the wrong person, but Ron and Harry think that is unlikely, since there probably aren't that many monsters in the castle, and the attacks must have stopped after he was expelled. Ron mentions Harry running into Hagrid in Nocturne Alley, and Harry says he was buying flesh-eating slug repellent. The trio falls silent until Hermione wonders if they should go ask Hagrid. Ron thinks that would be a cheerful visit, sarcastically saying, Hello Hagrid, tell us, have you been setting anything Mad and Harry loose in the castle lately? They end up deciding not to say anything unless there is another attack and become hopeful that they won't have to at all, since nearly four months has passed since Justin and nearly Headless Nick were petrified. The mandrakes were nearly ready, and people were starting to act normal around him again. During the Easter holidays, the second years had to choose their subjects for third year. Harry wants to give up potions, and Ron thinks defense against the dark arts is useless when taught by Lockhart, but they can't give up their old subjects. They just have to choose new subjects to study along with them. Arithmancy, study of ancient runes, divination, muggle studies, and care of magical creatures. Percy tells Harry to play to his strengths, but Harry feels like the only thing he is really good at is Quidditch, and ends up choosing the same subjects as Ron. Gryffindor's next Quidditch match is against Hufflepuff, and Wood is insisting that the team practice every night after dinner. The evening before Saturday's match leaves Harry feeling pretty good until he heads up to his dormitory after practice. Harry runs into Neville, who says he doesn't know who did it, but someone had gone through all of Harry's things. The contents of his trunk were thrown everywhere, pockets turned inside out, and some pages ripped out of books. Ron, Seamus, and Dean enter and wonder what happened. Harry says he doesn't know, but Ron says it looks like someone's been looking for something and asks if anything is missing. Harry realizes that Riddle's diary is gone and motions for Ron to follow him back down to the mostly empty common room where Hermione was reading a book. Harry fills her in and she says that only a Gryffindor could have stolen it because no one else knows their password. The next day is a beautiful sunny day that puts Wood in a good mood because it was perfect Quidditch conditions for their match. He tries to cheer up Harry and convince him to eat breakfast because Harry is very distracted, wondering if the diary thief was right in front of him. Hermione wants him to report the robbery, but Harry was afraid to spread the word about the diary and the reason Hagrid was expelled. As the trio left the Great Hall, Harry again hears the creepy whisper and asks if Ron and Hermione can hear it too. They can't, but Hermione's eyes go wide as she figures something out and says she needs to go to the library. She rushes off and Harry and Ron are left behind, bewildered. Ron tells Harry he better hurry up since it's nearly 11, and Harry races up to get his broomstick and meet his teammates. He is still very worried about the disembodied voice, but feels much better knowing everyone is outside to watch the match. As the teams start their warm-up, Professor McGonagall marches onto the pitch and announces through a purple megaphone that the match has been cancelled. Oliver lands his broom and runs towards her, protesting, but McGonagall completely ignores him and continues to give instructions to the students, telling them to head back to their common rooms to receive more information from their heads of house. She then beckons Harry over to her and tells him that she thinks he better go with her. Ron detaches himself from the crowd and runs up to them. McGonagall says that she does think he should go too. She leads them back to the school and into the hospital wing, warning them that this could come as a shock. She explains that there has been another attack, a double attack, and then Harry sees Madame Pomfrey tending to the petrified curly-haired Ravenclaw girl they had asked directions to the Slytherin common room. On the bed next to her, they see Hermione, laying frozen with her eyes wide open. McGonagall tells them that they found the girls near the library, with a small mirror on the floor next to them. She wants to know if they could explain it, but Harry and Ron have no idea. McGonagall escorts them back to the Gryffindor Tower and addresses the rest of the Gryffindors, informing them that there will now be a 6 p.m. curfew. Teachers will escort them to each of their lessons. 
no student is to use the bathroom by themselves, and Quidditch and other evening activities are canceled. She also includes that if the attacks continue, it is likely the school will close. Climbing awkwardly out of the portrait hole, she leaves the Gryffindors to discuss the news. Lee Jordan points out that none of the Slytherins have been attacked, and it's Slytherin's monster, so he thinks they should just chuck out all of the Slytherins. Most of the Gryffindors clap, but Percy is just sitting in a pale and stunned silence. George tells Harry that he thinks it's because the other girl who was attacked, Penelope Clearwater, is a prefect, and Percy didn't think the monster would dare attack a prefect. Ron whispers to Harry, wondering what they should do and if they suspect Hagrid. The two decide that they need to go talk to him and that it's time to get out his dad's old invisibility cloak. They go to bed at the normal time, but once everyone else is asleep, they get back up and dressed and throw the cloak over themselves to sneak down through the castle. They have to make their way past teachers, prefix, and ghosts who are patrolling the corridors in pairs. They make it to the main doors with relief, hurry out towards Hagrid's house, and pull off the cloak right as they make it to his door. They knock and Hagrid answers, aiming a crossbow at them. He lowers it when he sees them and wonders what they are doing there, but still lets them in. He is clearly flustered as he tries to make them tea, drops several things, and ends up only serving them boiling water. Harry starts to bring up why they are visiting when there's another knock on the door. Harry and Ron dart back under the invisibility cloak and hide in a corner. Hagrid opens the door and finds Dumbledore and a short man wearing a pinstripe suit, scarlet tie, black cloak, purple pointed boots, and is carrying a lime green bowler hat. Ron whispers to Harry that it's his dad's boss, Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic. Hagrid drops into a chair, looking pale and sweaty, glancing from Dumbledore to Cornelius Fudge. Fudge explains that with the four attacks, the Ministry must do something. Hagrid says that he never, and looks at Dumbledore, saying, You know I never, Professor Dumbledore, sir. Dumbledore tells Fudge that Hagrid has his full confidence, but Fudge says that his record is against him and he's got to take him. Hagrid is trembling to realize that he's going to be taken back to Azkaban, and then there is yet another knock on the door. This time, it is Lucius Malfoy, who is looking for the headmaster and is pleased to see that Fudge is already present. Dumbledore asks what Lucius wants with him, and Malfoy presents him with an order of suspension, signed by all twelve governors, saying that the rate the attacks have been happening, there won't be any muggle-borns left. Fudge is alarmed at the idea, saying that if Dumbledore can't stop the attacks, who can? Malfoy says that remains to be seen, with a nasty smile, and points out that since all twelve have voted, it's done. Hagrid intercedes at this point, and begins shouting about how many of them Malfoy blackmailed and threatened, so they would agree, and saying that they can't take Dumbledore or they'll be killin's next. Dumbledore tells Hagrid to calm down, and agrees to step aside, but adds that he will only truly have left the school when none there are loyal to him, and that help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it. Harry is sure that Dumbledore's eyes flicker to the corner, where he and Ron are hiding under the invisibility cloak. Malfoy says those are admirable sentiments, that they will miss his individual way of running things, and how he hopes his successor can prevent any killings. He opens the door and bows Dumbledore out. Fudge waits for Hagrid to leave before him, but Hagrid hesitates and carefully says, if anyone wanted to find out some stuff, all they'd have to do is follow the spiders. Fudge stares at him and Hagrid agrees to leave, but then loudly says, and someone will need to feed Fang while I'm away. When the door closes behind them, Ron pulls off the invisibility cloak, saying they are in trouble now. With Dumbledore gone, there'll be an attack a day. The movie starts out with an aerial view of Hogwarts Castle, then swoops down and transitions to the trio as they walk through the courtyard, and Harry tells Ron and Hermione it was Hagrid who opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago. Hermione doesn't think that there is any way it can be Hagrid, and Ron thinks Tom Riddle sounds like a dirty, rotten snitch. Harry points out that the monster had killed someone and asks what any of them would have done. Hermione suggests asking Hagrid, and as Ron is saying, Have you been setting anything Mad and Harry loose in the castle? Hagrid walks up right behind them and says, Mad and Harry? You wouldn't be talking about me now, would you? The trio immediately say no in unison, followed by an awkward silence before Harry changes the subject and asks what Hagrid's got. He holds up a can of flesh-eating slug repellent and says it's for the mandrakes. 
According to Professor Sprout, they still have some growing up to do, but then they will get them chopped up and stewed and be able to unpetrify the people in the hospital. He tells them they best be looking after themselves in the meantime and heads off. Neville runs past him, calling out Harry's name and telling him he better come quick. They run up to his dormitory and find all of his belongings completely trashed. Hermione says that it had to be a Gryffindor because nobody else knows their password, unless it wasn't a student. Ron says they must have been looking for something, and Harry tells them that they found it, because Tom Riddle's diary is gone. The scene changes to just before the Quidditch match, at the end of Oliver Wood's speech, about being stronger and faster, and one of the twins jokes about them being afraid of Harry if they fly anywhere near him. The Gryffindor team is walking towards the Quidditch pitch when they are intercepted by Professor McGonagall, who says the match has been cancelled. A disgruntled Wood said she can't cancel Quidditch, but she silences him and sends them back to Gryffindor Tower. She tells Potter to stay so they can find Mr. Weasley because there is something they have to see. She walks the two boys into the hospital wing and warns them it could be shocking as they approach a petrified Hermione lying on a hospital bed. McGonagall tells them that she was found near the library along with a hand mirror and wonders if it means anything to them. Harry and Ron have no idea and look at Hermione upset as Harry touches her hand. The scene shifts again to the Gryffindor common room, where McGonagall makes an announcement about the new rules to be put in effect immediately. Students must return to their house common rooms by 6 o'clock every evening, and all students will be escorted to each lesson by a teacher. No exceptions. She also tells them that unless the culprit is caught, it is likely that Hogwarts could close. She leaves and Ginny looks troubled. Some Gryffindors whisper to one another. Lee Jordan and Percy Weasley exchange worried looks and Oliver Wood looks troubled. The shot widens, showing Neville, Dean, Seamus, and a couple other Gryffindors sitting around, also looking worried, with Harry and Ron in the background, standing by the spiral staircase. The camera zooms into them as Harry is telling Ron that they have got to talk to Hagrid. He doesn't believe that it is him, but thinks he might know how to get into the Chamber of Secrets if he did set the monster loose last time. Ron reminds Harry that McGonagall says they aren't allowed to leave the tower except for class, and Harry says he thinks that it's time to get his dad's old cloak out again. Transitioning to Hagrid's stone hut, we get a first-person view before the scene shifts to inside the hut, where Fang is dozing on a chair and Hagrid is holding a crossbow and making tea. He hears a knock at his door and looks suspiciously towards it, while readying the crossbow and asking who's there. He kicks open the door and doesn't see anyone until Ron and Harry remove the cloak and Harry asks what the crossbow is for. Hagrid looks a little relieved and tells them nothing. He starts to add on that he was just expecting, but cuts himself off to invite them in, sharing that he just made a pot of tea. He pours them tea with very shaky hands, overfilling one of the cups. The boys both look very concerned and Harry asks Hagrid if he is okay. He says that he is fine, but still seems very shaky, fumbling the teapot a bit. Harry asks if he heard about Hermione, and Hagrid says that he has, so Harry nervously proceeds to ask if Hagrid knows who opened the Chamber of Secrets. Hagrid sighs and starts to answer, saying, What you have to understand about that is. But he is cut off by another knock at the door. All three of them look at the door, startled, as Fang starts to bark. Hagrid hurries Harry and Ron back under the cloak, telling them to stay quiet. Ron throws the cloak over them both, and Hagrid answers the door, finding Professor Dumbledore and another man that Ron whispers to Harry is his dad's boss, Cornelius Fudge, Minister of Magic. Fudge explains that he had to come because the three attacks on Muggleborns is bad business, and the Ministry has got to act. Hagrid insists that he never, and implores Dumbledore to back him up. Dumbledore insists that Hagrid has his full confidence, but Fudge brings up Hagrid's record and says he's got to take him. Hagrid protests, realizing that Fudge is going to take him to Azkaban prison. As Fudge is saying they have no choice, Hagrid's door opens and Lucius Malfoy enters, pleased to see that Fudge is already there. Hagrid tells him to get out of his house, and Lucius, looking very snotty, says that he takes absolutely no pleasure being inside your... You call this a house? He goes on to explain that he was told the headmaster was here. Dumbledore wants to know what he wants with him, and Lucius tells him that the governors and he decided that it was time for him to step aside. He hands Dumbledore an order of suspension, saying that all twelve signatures are on it. Fudge looks like he wants to intercede, but Dumbledore takes the scroll as Lucius says they feel he's lost his touch, and with all these attacks, there'll be no Muggleborns left at Hogwarts. 
He goes on to insincerely call it an awful loss to the school. Hagrid tells Lucius that they can't take Dumbledore away, the Muggleborns won't stand a chance, and there will be killings next. Lucius says, You think so? And Dumbledore tells Hagrid to calm himself. He agrees to step aside, but adds that help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it, and then looks directly at the invisible Ron and Harry, who look surprised. Lucius looks around a bit and then says, Admirable sentiments, before beckoning him to leave with him. Dumbledore gives one last look and subtle nod in Harry and Ron's direction and follows Lucius out. Fudge tells Hagrid to come, but before leaving, Hagrid said that if anybody was looking for some stuff, then all they'd have to do would be to follow the spiders. Fudge looks extremely confused as Hagrid starts to walk out, also saying that someone will need to feed Fang while he's away. Fang gives a sleepy little growl and Fudge says, Good boy, as he leaves. The door closes and Harry and Ron remove the cloak. Ron says that Hagrid is right. With Dumbledore gone, there'll be an attack a day. This section of the movie stays very close to the book chapter, with only minor changes and some omitted details. The book starts out telling us that Harry had told Ron and Hermione all about what he learned in Riddle's diary, and gives the impression that they have discussed it many times at length, and always end up going in a circle. The movie starts out just showing us when the trio have the conversation. Hermione just doesn't think it could be Hagrid, and Ron calls Riddle a snitch. Rightfully so, really. Mm -hmm. Harry points out that the monster had killed someone and asks what they would have done in that situation. Which is slightly different from the conversations we hear about in the book, though still very similar in nature, because Hermione thinks that Riddle may have gotten the wrong person. However, in the book, Ron points out that the castle isn't likely to hold that many different monsters. I don't know, though, Ron. It's a big-ass castle. Like, have you been paying attention these last couple years? Seriously, because we also get to take a trip down memory lane as the chapter reminds us about the different large and monstrous pets of Hagrid's they had already encountered. Let's see, there's Fluffy, the giant-ass three-headed dog, Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback Dragon, and that was just the first book! Right? Seriously. The book even says that Harry has no doubt that if Hagrid heard there was a monster cooped up somewhere in the castle, he would totally release it just so it could stretch its legs. Which is funny, since it doesn't actually have legs. <laughs> Don't jump ahead, we're getting there. Right. So, currently it seems pretty likely that Hagrid would absolutely try to adopt Slytherin's monster. Yep, but not the one in his pants. <laughs> Dirty. <laughs> In the book, Ron tries a different tactic, saying Riddle sounds like Percy since he told on Hagrid. Which basically happens in the movie too, since Ron calls Riddle a snitch. Yeah, but in a shocking turn of events, the book actually had Hermione point out that the monster had killed someone, not Harry like the movie did. <gasps> I feel like at this point, it's just Hermione's comeuppance for all the lines she's stolen. True, no one can deny that she's guilty of Grand Theft Audio. Grand Theft Audio? Really? Speaking of crimes, that pun was so bad it should be illegal. Then cuff me, because I ain't taking it back. Grand Theft Audio. <laughs> okay. Let's just keep rolling. Fine. <laughs> In the book, they had Harry point out that Riddle was going to have to return to the Muggle Orphanage if they closed Hogwarts, and saying that he didn't blame him for wanting to stay. That wasn't mentioned in the movie at all. As we talked about last week, Riddle just told Dumbledore that he didn't have anywhere to go if they closed Hogwarts. Yeah, they never even mention the orphanage in this movie. But we will hear about it in a later movie. Mm -hmm. The book also has Ron ask about Harry running into Hagrid in Nocturne Alley. And Harry said that he was buying flesh-eating slug repellent. Which doesn't exactly get mentioned in the movie, though there will be reference to it. Because in both, Hermione suggests going to ask Hagrid about it all, and Ron says it will be a cheerful visit. Hello, Hagrid. Tell us, have you been setting anything mad and hairy loose in the castle lately? <laughs> mad and hairy? <laughs> Giggity? <laughs> in the movie, as Ron is saying mad and hairy, Hagrid actually walks up behind them and wonders if they're talking about him. Which isn't how it happened in the book, but was so cute I didn't mind the addition. <laughs> the trio were all like... No! In perfect, suspicious unison. <laughs> yeah. Good save, guys. That was totally natural. Totally. Mm -hmm. 
This is also when the movie makes the reference to the flesh-eating slug repellent, because Harry asks Hagrid what he's got, and Hagrid is carrying the can of it. Which is a nice little throwback to the book. But in the book, they just decide that they won't say anything unless there's another attack. And as time goes by, they reach nearly four months since Justin and nearly headless Nick had been petrified. Everyone is starting to feel like the attacker retired, and people are even starting to treat Harry normal again. Yeah, Peeves even gets tired of his Potter You Rotter song. I wish we could have gotten tired of it. You know, hearing it too many times in the movie and all. But alas, no Peeves. Sad panda. Wah wah. <sighs> in the book, they also mention the Mandrakes throwing a loud and raucous party in Greenhouse 3, which was an indication that they are maturing nicely. Professor Sprout tells them that as soon as they start trying to move into each other's pots, they'll know that they're fully matured. I love that the Mandrakes have to literally mature. Like they have to go through puberty before they're ready. The movie delivers this information to us through Hagrid, who tells us the flesh-eating slug repellent is for the Mandrakes. He says that according to Professor Sprout, they still have some maturing to do, but once their acne clears up, they will be able to chop them up and stew them. This part isn't mentioned here in the book, but in last week's chapter, it's exactly what Professor Sprout tells Filch, so this was clearly in reference to that. Yeah, in the movie, Hermione looks pretty startled at the chop em up and stew em comment, and it does seem pretty fucking gross, since we've essentially established the Mandrakes as being, like, human-esque. Right, they're technically plants, mm -hmm. but they're also, a, like, little beings, so right? chopping them up and stewing them seems particularly disturbing. Seriously. But after that, Hagrid tells them to look after themselves in the meantime. And then Neville comes running up to them, telling Harry he'd better come quick. That's not how it happened in the book. They omit the part about the second years choosing their subjects for third year. Harry wants to give up potions, because of Snape. And Ron glumly says that they can't. They have to keep all their old classes, or he would give up defense against the dark arts. Which shocks Hermione, because it's such an important class. And Ron says, not the way Lockhart teaches it. Inconceivable. <laughs> but everyone is asking for advice on which subjects to take, and Percy tells Harry to play to his strengths. Since Harry feels like Quidditch is the only thing he's good at, he just picks the same subjects as Ron. Honestly, that's probably what I would have done, too. I would probably do what Hermione did and just sign up for everything. <gasps> Inconceivable. I embrace my extraness. It's gotten me this far. <laughs> but the book also mentions that Oliver her wood has the Gryffindor Quidditch team practicing every night before their next match. And it has Harry in a good mood because he feels like their chances for the Quidditch Cup have never been better. Then his good mood gets spoiled because he's heading to drop off his broomstick and runs into Neville, who looks frantic and tells Harry he doesn't know who did it. And now we are back on track. Yeah, the only real difference between the book and the movie here is that the movie streamlined this scene and just had Hermione run up to their dormitory with them. Mm -hmm. When in the book, it was just Harry and Neville who were soon joined by Ron, Dean, and Seamus. Yeah, but in both, Harry's stuff is tossed all about and Ron establishes that it looks like someone was searching for something. Yep. And then Harry realizes the diary is missing. And in the book, he beckons Ron to follow him out of the dormitory, and they head down to the Gryffindor common room, where they find Hermione reading by herself. Harry tells them that Riddle's diary is missing, and Hermione says that only a Gryffindor could have stolen it. No one else knows their password. Yeah, great detective work, Columbo. <laughs> the movie has her saying that in the dorms, too. But, I mean, come on. Like, sure, Hermione, because no one else could have found out the Gryffindor password and gotten in. Inconceivable. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. What? That's inconceivable. Anyways, let's just keep rolling. <laughs> this part of the movie has always kind of annoyed me, because in the book, it was the attention drawn to the diary when Harry gets accosted by the dwarf cupid that alerts the thief to the fact that Harry even has the diary. The movie gives no explanation whatsoever to how someone even knew that he had it to steal it from him. I had never actually thought about it, but it probably will bother me now that you broke that glass for me, thanks. Join me in my misery. <laughs> <laughs> but both the book and the movie transition to the Quidditch match. 
Though the movie cuts out the part where the team is at breakfast and Oliver Wood is trying to cheer Harry up and convince him to eat a good breakfast. Harry is just looking up and down the Gryffindor table, wondering if the diary thief is right in front of his eyes. Yeah, the movie just cuts right to the Gryffindor team getting ready for the Quidditch match. Which also cuts out Harry leaving the Great Hall and hearing the creepy whisper again. He asks if Ron and Hermione can hear it, and something clearly clicks for Hermione. She says she's understood something and runs off to the library, which is also a moment that's pretty important to the plot, which we'll get to. Yeah, that's definitely not how it happened in the movie. I wish they had included it, because aside from being an important moment, Harry also asks what Hermione has understood, and Ron said, loads more than I do. <laughs> Book Ron is funny <laughs> and smart. Mm -hmm. The movie's totally bilked him. Facts. But after this section of the book, it basically lines back up with the film, at least in the sense that they all head out to the Quidditch pitch. The way they structure it is different. Yeah, in the movie, Oliver Wood gives a really lame motivational speech. It's pretty sad, actually. Like, I still wish they would have made Oliver more fanatical. Me too. Mm-hmm. Then they head out to the pitch as one of the twins adds the joke that the other team is terrified to fly near Harry because he might petrify them. Which is funny, but also a little bit out of place since the book already established that so much time has passed since the last attack that people are starting to relax and even be normal around Harry again. Yeah. Then before they can get out to the pitch, McGonagall intercepts them and lets them know that this match has been cancelled. Which is actually kind of another moment where the movie downplayed a book scene. Mm -hmm. Because in the book, the teams are starting their warm-up, and McGonagall marches out onto the field with a giant purple megaphone and announces to the whole school that the match has been cancelled and sends them all back to the dormitories. Oh yeah, the movie definitely understated that. She just makes her little speech to the Gryffindor team, silences Wood when he tries to protest, then tells Harry to stay with her so they can find Mr. Weasley because there is something they have to see. In the book, Oliver Wood lands and runs up to McGonagall, still holding his broom between his legs. <laughs> and I just love the image that conjures. <laughs> he tries to protest and she just flat out ignores him, continuing to make her announcement. She then beckons Harry over to her and tells him he better go with her. Ron sees this and detaches himself from the crowd to join them, and she surprises Harry by saying he better come too. In both, she leads them to the hospital wing, telling them this will be a bit of a shock. And they find out that Hermione has been petrified. How the hell is McGonagall just gonna spring petrified Hermione on Ron and Harry? Like, maybe give the 12-year-olds a little bit of warning what they're walking into instead of just saying, this may be a wee bit of a shock. A wee bit, you think? In the book, she did actually give them a bit more of a warning. Hmm. In addition to saying it will be a shock, she also mentions that there was another double attack. Though still, a heads up that one of the attackees was Hermione would have been nice. Right? Seriously. Ugh. The movie also completely omits the second attack, and we only see a petrified Hermione. Yeah, in the book, the other girl who was attacked was the curly-haired Ravenclaw girl that Robin Hoyle asked for directions to the Slytherin common room. But aside from leaving her out, the details are the same. Yep, found near the library. Which was our trivia question. Yep, and found with a hand mirror. In both, McGonagall asks if they know anything about the mirror. And in both, Harry and Ron have no idea. Mm-hmm. But this is why I don't like the fact that the movie left out the part where Hermione has her epiphany and runs off to the library. I feel like the movie just leaves you wondering what Hermione was doing near the library when everyone else was out at the Quidditch match. I mean, it's Hermione. Her being near the library isn't that much of a stretch. Like, is she ever more than 20 paces from the library at any given point? Well, that depends on where the library is located in relation to their dorm room. <sighs> but she's also never missed a Quidditch match, because she's a good friend. Eh, I suppose that's true. Also, for some reason in the movie, Harry reaches out to touch petrified Hermione's hand. Like, Harry, seriously, like, stop trying to hold hands with petrified people. It's weird, dude. Don't be known as that guy. <laughs> Harry apparently just needs to feel things to believe them. Remember how he touched the barrier, too, after Ron said it sealed itself? <clears throat> apparently feeling is believing. Sure, let's go with that. <laughs> but then, McGonagall walks Harry and Ron back up to the Gryffindor Tower so she can also address the students there. 
The movie just transitions right from Harry holding Hermione's hand to McGonagall reading off the new rules. Students must return to their common room by 6 p.m. and be escorted to class by a teacher. No exceptions. But seriously, did McGonagall really need that whole piece of parchment for just two rules? <laughs> the book does actually include a few more, aside from the ones mentioned in the movie. They also aren't allowed to leave the dormitories after 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. No one is allowed to use the bathroom unaccompanied by a teacher. Which is a super awkward rule, because I get really pee shy. TMI, Katie. I'm just saying! Like, having a teacher hanging out in the bathroom when I'm trying to go would be just as bad as moaning Myrtle. And don't even get me started on if I needed to poo. Oh, I won't. I won't get you started. <laughs> Let's just you keep sure? rolling. But I could tell we're you just... all about it. No, oh no, we're gonna roll. We're gonna but just I... keep rolling. All right. McGonagall also announces that Quidditch training and matches are postponed and there are no more evening activities. She also adds that she has rarely been so distressed, and unless the culprit is caught, it is likely the school will close. And then she heads out. She does say that last part in the movie, too. Then she leaves, and the camera first focuses on Ginny, and that shifty look from her is an awesome little bit of foreshadowing. Oh, for sure. And that's a good example of something the movie successfully added, because they don't even make reference to Ginny's reaction in the book at all. But it's nice the movie did that, since they left out a lot of other moments of foreshadowing that includes her. Another difference is that in the book, after McGonagall left, everyone in Gryffindor immediately starts talking. Lee Jordan is basically running for office when he goes on and on about how no one from Slytherin has been attacked and it's Slytherin's monster, so they should just chuck out all the Slytherins. As a Slytherin, he does not have my vote. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm-hmm. They also give us another piece to the Percy the Letter Writing shut-in puzzle. He's in a stunned silence, and George tells Harry that the Ravenclaw girl who was petrified, Penelope Clearwater, was a prefect, and Percy didn't think the monster would dare attack a prefect. But there's more to it than that, which we will soon learn. Yeah, none of that was included in the movie. They just had a few people whispering in the background and focused on a few of the Gryffindor characters silently reacting to the news. Lee, Jordan, and Percy exchange worried looks. Oliver Wood looks completely troubled. I mean, can you blame him? What is Oliver Wood going to do without Quidditch? Well, there is that. But then the camera angle widens, showing us Dean, Seamus, and Neville all sitting around looking concerned. And we can see Ron and Harry in the background standing by the spiral staircase. The camera zooms into them as they discuss going to see Hagrid. In the book, the boys have a whispered conversation that is basically the same. Ron wants to know what they are going to do and wonders if they suspect Hagrid. Harry says they need to go talk to him. He doesn't believe it's him this time, but if it was him last time, he'll know how to get into the Chamber of Secrets. Ron reminds Harry that they aren't allowed to leave the tower. Yeah, Ron, because rules about not being out of bed have really deterred us in the past. <laughs> right? <laughs> Harry counters that by saying it's time to get out his dad's old cloak again. In the book, we get a little reminder about what the cloak is, and the boys go through the motions, pretending to get ready for bed, waiting until everyone else is asleep, before they get back up, get out the cloak, and sneak through the castle, avoiding the ghost teachers and prefix, patrolling the corridors in pairs, to get down to Hagrid's hut. The movie just transitions right from Harry saying it's time to get Dad's old cloak out again, to a camera shot that looks like the boys approaching Hagrid's hut from under the invisibility cloak. But there is a deleted scene where Harry gets out the invisibility cloak so he and Ron can go see Hagrid. Which, honestly, the transition was just fine without it, but I wish they'd left it in because I don't like it when they cut things out. <laughs> no, really? 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 <laughs> but aside from a few changes, the movie scene stayed very true to the book here. It starts out just a touch different because in the book, they make it to his hut and pull off the cloak before knocking on the door. Yeah, the movie cuts to Hagrid holding a crossbow and making tea. He hears a knock at the door, readies the crossbow, and opens the door, seeing no one. Just a tip, though, maybe don't surprise the guy holding the goddamn crossbow by jumping out from under an invisibility cloak. It was probably just so they could have the visual of Harry and Ron appearing from under the cloak, mm. but I do think the book was better since Hagrid was clearly jumpy. Mm -hmm. In both, Harry wants to know what the crossbow is for, and Hagrid says nothing. The hell do you mean, what's it for? 
Home Slice lives on the edge of a dark forest, and he just had someone knock on his door at nighttime with a monster on the loose. <laughs> Home Slice. <laughs> the details between the two vary somewhat here as well. In the book, Hagrid lets them in and tries to make tea for them, but fumbles his way through it, spilling things, dropping things, and ultimately ends up serving them hot water because he forgot the tea bags. Yeah, movie Hagrid invites them in and already has the tea made, though he does show his nerves when he overpours the tea, prompting Harry to ask if he is okay. Hagrid says he's fine, so Harry brings up Hermione and then flat out asks Hagrid if he knows who opened the Chamber of Secrets. Hagrid starts to explain, but is interrupted by another knock at the door. In the book, they never directly ask him about the chamber. Harry gets as far as asking if he heard about Hermione, and then they are interrupted by the knock at the door. I want to know why Hagrid didn't answer the door with the crossbow the second time. Like, he just tells Harry and Ron to get under the cloak and keep quiet, the both of them. I also love that he specified the both of them, because clearly he just meant Harry had to be quiet and Ron could talk. I mean, Harry does keep quiet and Ron does talk, so <laughs> apparently even with specifying, Ron couldn't follow directions. Can he ever? Touché. <laughs> but in the book, Hagrid does grab the crossbow again and then opens the door to reveal Dumbledore and a stranger that Ron informs us through explaining to Harry that it's his dad's boss, Cornelius Fudge, Minister of Magic. After that, things stay really true to the book, aside from the extremely normal way that Fudge is dressed. Yeah, the movie just has him in a plain, drab suit and traveling cloak. Boring. Mm -hmm. Book Fudge is described to be wearing a pinstriped suit, scarlet tie, a long black cloak, and purple pointed boots. He's also carrying a lime green bowler hat. That sounds dapper as fuck. Right? <laughs> right? I miss the fact that they really don't ever have them fail at dressing like muggles in the movie. But aside from the clothes, the conversation that ensues is pretty spot on. Fudge says it's bad business, and because of all the attacks, the Ministry has to act. Hagrid protests, Dumbledore insists that Hagrid has his full confidence, and Fudge doesn't care, because he just needs to make it look like the Ministry is doing something. In the book, Dumbledore also says that taking Hagrid away won't help in the slightest, and Fudge tells him to look at it from his point of view. He's under a lot of pressure. Oh, Right? <laughs> Poor Fudge. Poor baby. If it turns out it wasn't Hagrid, he'll be back with no more said, but he's gotta take him. He says he's gotta take him in the movie, too. Yeah, and in both, poor Hagrid is like, take me, take me where? Take me home tonight. I don't wanna let you go till you see the light. <laughs> but really, it's Azkaban. <laughs> Fudge wants to take Hagrid to Azkaban prison. Facts. Then there's yet another knock on the door, and Dumbledore answers it, revealing Lucius Malfoy. In the movie, he doesn't knock. He just pushes open the door, looking like a Revolutionary War general with his hair in a pretty black bow. It was a very pretty bow. It was. He's so pretty. In both, he's looking all superior and pleased that Fudge is already there, and Hagrid tells him to get out of his house. Yeah, and this is one of those scenes that shows just how well Jason Isaacs nailed playing Lucius. Like, everything about his voice to his facial expressions just oozed that snotty, bigoty, Nazi von douchebaggity oiliness. <laughs> <laughs> he tells Hagrid that he takes absolutely no pleasure being inside your... You call this a house? Ugh. 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 What a Nazi von <laughs> douche. Mm -hmm. But he goes on to explain that he called ahead to the school and was told the headmaster would be there. Dumbledore is all like, bitch, what you want with me? Right. The book describes him as speaking politely, but with fire blazing in his blue eyes. You couldn't quite see Dumbledore's eyes in the film, but Richard Harris's voice said it all in how he delivered the line. And rightfully so, because nothing good can come of Lucius Malfoy seeking out Dumbledore. He serves him with an order of suspension with all 12 governor's signatures on it. Yeah, and in both, he goes on to tell Dumbledore that they feel he's lost his touch, saying with all the attacks, there'll be no muggle-borns left, and we all know what an awful loss that would be to the school. And Jason Isaac's delivery is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's so condescending and insincere. 
For some reason, I feel like the only thing missing from Lucius telling Dumbledore that he's lost his touch is a super condescending old boy at the end. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, we feel you've rather lost your touch, old boy. (laughs) That definitely would have clinched it. Right? Just it was needed. The movie veers away from the book a bit at this point. Because it has Hagrid immediately start to protest that they can't take away Dumbledore. The Muggleborns won't stand a chance and they'll be killings next. (laughs) The book first has Fudge protest. Lucius reminds him that it's a matter for the governors and that Dumbledore has failed to stop the attacks. Fudge says that if Dumbledore can't stop them, who can? Lucius just says that remains to be seen. But all 12 of them have voted and... Then this is when Hagrid joins in, though he first yells at Lucius, wondering how many of the governors he threatened and blackmailed. Lucius comments on Hagrid's temper, and he's such a dick for this. Mm. He's, he advises him not to yell at the Azkaban guards like that because they won't like that. Mm. Ugh. <laughs> but Hagrid just keeps on yelling that they can't take Dumbledore. And it's back to the line they used in the movie. But this is another one of the moments from the book where Hagrid is basically having a meltdown because he's so angry and it just doesn't seem like the movie hits that. Yeah, we talked about that when Hagrid tells Harry that he's a wizard Mm -hmm. in Sorcerer's Stone and then gets upset when he realizes that Harry has no idea who he is, who his parents were, how they died, etc. Mm-hmm. Book Hagrid was way more rageful than movie Hagrid, and I agree that it's the same here. In the book, he has this whole huge rant and goes on and on until Dumbledore full-on cuts him off, telling him to calm himself. Which, I mean, he does that in the movie too, but though he's clearly upset, he only makes that one comment and is already done speaking when Dumbledore tells him to calm himself. And by that point, I'm sitting there thinking, like, dude's already calm, man. Right? But in both, Dumbledore agrees to step aside and very clearly states that help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it. Though in the book, he also prefaces that by saying he will only truly have left the school when none there are loyal to him. And in both, Lucius calls them admirable sentiments. Though in the movie, he looks a bit confused and looks around like he's trying to figure out who the hell Dumbledore's talking to. However, in both, they give a hard sell on the fact that Dumbledore clearly knows Harry and Ron are right there. Oh yeah, the book says that for a split second, Harry is sure Dumbledore's eyes flicker towards the corner where they hid. Yeah, the movie spells it out even more. Dumbledore looks right at them, like, twice. Even gives them a little head nod. The only thing that was missing was a wink. It always makes me wonder if he can actually see them. Or maybe he senses their presence? Or maybe he's just that fucking good of a guesser. This should be our Potter pondering, actually. I'd love to know what our keepers think about this. Works for me. Another difference, though, is that in the books... Lucius also went on to say that they shall all miss his highly individual way of running things and hope that his successor manages to prevent any, uh, killings. <laughs> I wish they would have left that line in. Like, because he's full on mocking the way Hagrid says killin, and it's delightfully nasty. Plus, you just know Jason Isaacs would have delivered the shit out of that line. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. But maybe they thought he was already condescending enough for one scene. Mm. Because they just had him gesture for Dumbledore to follow and walk out the door. Then in the book, Fudge is waiting for Hagrid to leave. But Hagrid instead also appears to talk to no one, telling them to follow the spiders if they want to find out some stuff. He says that in the movie too, but it's after Fudge tells him to come, because apparently he's a dog. But Fudge's face cracks me up in that scene. He's just looking at him like, are you high right now, man? Like, what the f- who the fuck are you talking to? What? Right? What is going on right now? (laughs) The book says he stares at him in amazement. Hagrid says he's coming, and in both, he adds on that someone will need to feed Fang while he's away. In the book, the door closes, and Ron removes the cloak, saying they're in trouble now. With Dumbledore gone, there'll be an attack a night. And the chapter ends on Fang howling at the door. In the movie, Fang is dozing on the chair and gives a sleepy little growl as Hagrid says his name and walks out the door. Fudge says, good boy. And I'm not 100% positive who he's talking to, Fang or Hagrid. 
And the movie section ends on Ron saying that Hagrid was right. With Dumbledore gone, there'll be an attack a day. Yep, so very similar. Mm -hmm. But this will bring us to the part where we cover new actors. And for this section, the only new one is Robert Hardy as Cornelius Fudge. Which, aside from his lacking odd outfit, I feel like he was very Mm Fudge-like. He struck me as weak and blustery, a little pompous. Yeah, I gotta say, I think he did a great job. Like, he's the shortest one in this scene, so he does kind of bring a little bit of that Napoleon complex feel going on there. And, like, he plays into it. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. He doesn't really do too much here, but we will see more of him in later films and talk more about him then, too. Yeah, we will get a much better idea of his character in the future stories, especially in the books. Yeah, definitely. But I think he did a good job. Mm Mm-hmm. Me too. And this will bring us to our Potter Pondering. Which is, do you think Dumbledore could actually see Ron and Harry under the invisibility cloak? Or is his perception so high that he can just sense they are there? Or is he just that good at guessing? Hmm. Let us know what you think. Yeah, we'll have our post up on Facebook for you. Yep. And that'll bring us to this week's Sorting Hat story, which is from Josie Goodwin. She writes, I'm a proud Gryffindor with some Hufflepuff tendencies. I feel you, girl. <laughs> My Patronus is a dolphin, and my wand is redwood with a unicorn hair core, 10 inches, and rigid flexibility. My dad gave me his copy of Sorcerer's Stone on the last day of first grade. I had been reluctant to read Harry Potter, but he insisted I would like it, and we read a chapter a night before bed. Aww. The next summer, we bought Chamber of Secrets and did the same thing. Originally, we were planning on continuing this, but I couldn't wait. We started the fourth book together, but I couldn't wait another night, so I continued on my own. (laughs) Gee, Ellen, you have no idea what that's like, do you? I don't know what you mean. (laughs) Since then, I have become obsessed. I've seen the movies thousands of times, had three Harry Potter birthday parties, and own a bit too many Harry Potter pops. There's no such thing, sweetheart. When I was 11, I developed anorexia, and I have to say that this series has helped me so much through the difficult times. It gave me a place to escape when real life just seemed too hard. Fast forward to now. I'm 15, and though I'm still struggling a bit, I'm doing much better. I have recently expanded my Harry Potter obsession to podcasts, and I found you guys through Swish and Flick. Great job with all you do. Thank you, Josie. That's so sweet. I know. I think she might be my Patronus. Right? <laughs> Seriously. I know that Harry Potter has helped Ellen and me with our own struggles, so it's... It's just really nice to hear how it's helped other people, too. I love those stories. Yeah, and we hope that you continue to do better and better. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Yeah. If any other Keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, the wood, core, and length, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Definitely. And this will bring us to this week's trivia question, which is, what are the Gryffindors and Hufflepuffs pruning during Herbology class? The prize for the first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag go green will get a bitch is a witch, motherfuckers a wizard, a just keep rolling, or a pride sticker. We also just got in our order of that's not how it happened in the book and that's not how it happened in the movie stickers. Yay! So those can now be a sticker option too. Woohoo! <laughs> Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us. If you're an Apple person, you can do it through the Apple Podcast or iTunes app. If you don't have Apple, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. And again, following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com. We'll get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. You can also go to our website at justkeeprolling.com to check out our Just Keep Rolling and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. I just can't wait for our That's Not How It Happened shirts to arrive. Right? In the book for me and in the movie for you. Mm Mm-hmm. 
and join us next Friday when we talk about Chapter 15, Aragog, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. Thank you.